thank you all for coming in. It's, uh, it's fantastic to see such a great crowd tonight. Uh, I want to start first by acknowledging that we are here tonight on the traditional homeland of many nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, First Nation, the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, uh, the Wendat peoples, and it's now home to many diverse nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, as well as settlers, migrants, newcomers, and those, caught, those who were brought here involuntarily through the transatlantic slave trade. Together, under the Dish with One Spoon covenant, we share the responsibility for future generations. And in case you haven't figured it out, because I haven't said anything yet, my name is Stephen Evans. Once again, welcome. I'm delighted so many of you could come out tonight to celebrate the opening of my exhibition, as it is. And to hear the discussion about Ontario placed by our distinguished panel, the Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson, John Ralston Saul, and Walter Kim. I'm really delighted that they have agreed to speak this evening, and I, I like you, look forward to, hearing, to what, uh, hearing what they have to say. I also want to acknowledge those who have helped make this show happen, starting with the good folks at Urban Space, Margie Zeidler, of course. <laughs> Vicki Rogers, Jennifer Ward, and Sean Kanepa, who have provided this fantastic space, their expertise, and enthusiastic assistance. I also want to thank Fernanda, Aaron, and Scott at Akau Framing, Luana and staff at Dark Horse Espresso Bar for catering and bar service, Daniel Bowman of Daniel Bowman Productions for volunteering to videotape this event. It's quite a production. The results of this will be available on YouTube soon. It's not uh, going direct to air, but it will be uh, up soon. Michelle Smith of the visual department for the wall signage, the spacing store for handling the book sales, and Colleen Clancy and Dieter Hessel of Heliographics for their printing and design services. Lastly, I am grateful to Kendall Townen, Vic Pawa, Fran Francesca Buon of Ontario Place for All, Cynthia Blackman, Kara Evans, James Evans, Jen Park, Alex McIntosh, Ted Irvine, and Maya, S M Maya Marie Sutnick for their input, advice, and encouragement. The exhibition surrounding you is a selection of works ex ex excerpted from my book, As It Is, which I commenced in late 2020. The book was completed and went to press in July of 2023, but I've continued photographing at Ontario Place as, moved, as it has moved closer and closer to being totally sealed off from public access. So the photographs that are in the middle of the exhibition are recent photographs that are not previously published in the book, and the book is represented by a selection on the periphery walls. Doug Ford's determination to monetize our public park by leasing it to a privately owned foreign company to build a pay-as-you-go spa and entertainment facility is, in part, what drove me to document Ontario Place before it substantially changes forever. Sadly, we are now at a threshold of irreversible damage at Ontario Place, especially the West Island. With the erasure of a once honored heritage site designed by one of Canada's finest landscape architects, Michael Huff. In the upcoming days, the destruction of the forest on West Island will begin in earnest. An act of governmental impunity supported by the enactment of Bill 154 the New Deal for Toronto Act, what a deal, which exempts the government from established protections included in the Environment Act, the Environmental Bill of Rights, the Heritage Act, and the Planning Act. It also strips citizens of their democratic right to challenge the government in court about any issues pertaining to Ontario Place. It may be too late to stop the chainsaws, but there is a group of concerned citizens that I want to talk about called the OPP, the Ontario Place Protectors, who undaunted by the Ford government are challenging the validity of Bill 154 with a request for a judicial review. In a recent re uh, press release of theirs, OPP states, the government has taken extraordinary powers to ensure an unobstructed route to the destruction of the cultural landscape of Ontario Place exempting itself from any environmental and heritage laws. 
preventing citizens from challenging any government action, including this fees. We believe the provincial government is breaching the public above, uh, uh, the principles of public trust. Bill 154 does not comport with the rule of law, eliminates the right to virtually all claims and or challenges that could be brought against government, and does not comport with the rules of natural justice and procedural fairness. Not surprisingly, the Attorney General has asked the court to dismiss the case because, as he says, and this is quote, it is frivolous and vexatious and a waste of the court's time. The court has not yet responded. Regardless of the outcome of this case, if we can't make the government accountable now, we certainly can do so in the next election. It is almost 2026. It's going to be here very fast. <laughs> I promise. A lot is at stake, and you all know what to do. And finally, a bit of shameless self-promotion. <laughs> Business. The photographs in this exhibition are available for purchase. All of the images are available in three different sizes that you see on the walls. Please feel free to approach me directly this evening if you are interested, or you can reach me through my website. Uh, my business cards are also uh, present. Or they're, they're here at the, um, uh, at the book, uh, at Spacing's book uh, shop. Please also consider purchasing my book, which is available this evening from the pop-up Spacing store located in the hallway on the opposite end of the gallery. I'm pleased to let you know that 20% of the sales garnered this evening and for the next two weeks will be donated to help fund the legal case being pursued by the Ontario Place Protectors. The OPP will be setting up a donation webpage in the days ahead, but if you wish to donate this evening, again, please tap on my shoulder and I'll give you the details on how to do so. So thank you again for coming out this evening. I'm very grateful to you all. I hope you enjoy the exhibition and panel discussion. And now I'd like to turn things over to, the, to our moderator of tonight's panel, uh, discussion journalist, John Lawrence. Thank you all. Thanks, Steve. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Good. Um, so this is what we're going to do this evening. Um, we're going to um, hear from our august panel members um, who are, uh, who've been asked to answer a question um, that I'm going to pose in a moment. Um, if we have time after, um, after their answers, we'll, we may have time for a couple of questions from the audience. And so just raise your hand if you, when we get to that point. Um, I, so I actually warned them on a Zoom call the other day, and I'll warn you as well, I interrupt people for a living. And so if you go on and on, I'll interrupt you and ask you to ask a question. Um, so uh, before uh, introducing the panelists, I'd like to acknowledge Jane Zeidler and Bridget Huff, who have joined us as they have uh, on the occasion. OK, so <clears throat> first I'll introduce the speakers who don't really need any introduction. Uh, to my immediate right, the Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson was Canada's 26th Governor General from 1999 to 2005. After she left Rideau Hall, she co-founded the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, which helps new citizens feel involved and included in Canadian life. Uh, a privy councillor and a companion of the Order of Canada, Adrian is the National Institute on Aging's honorary chair for its advisory board. Um, uh, in the middle, John Ralston Saul is an award-winning essayist, novelist, and Governor General's award winner. Um, not this Governor General award. His 16 books have been translated into 28 languages and 37 countries. He's written extensively about Canada and is the co-founder of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship probably with this Governor General, and President Emeritus of Penn International. John is a companion of the Order of Canada and the Order of Ontario. And on the far right, uh, landscape architect Walter Kem was born in New York City and moved to Toronto in 1965. His projects include Petticoat Creek Conservation Area, the Ashbridges Bay Headlands, Bluffers Park, Tommy Thompson Park Plan, Trillium Park, and the Humber Bay Regeneration Plan, which is currently underway. 
He served on the Royal Commission on the Future of the Ontario Waterfront, which was chaired, as we all know, by David Crombie, and advocates for a green, diverse, connected, affordable, and accessible Ontario place. Um, so I'm going to pose the first question, question to John. Um, and it's gonna, this is what I'd like to ask you. So there's plenty of evidence to show that Doug Ford here's, um, uh, decided early on that he wanted to build a large private attraction at <coughs> Ontario Pace and then backfilled the approvals process to justify that outcome. What does this say to you about the current system of, de of democratic checks and balances in Ontario? Well, the, th the thing about, you know, Canadian-style democracy is part of its law and part of it is, a large part of it is, that when you have power, you have to remember that most of it is not, that most of what you're supposed to do, the rules, are not written down. That we're, you know, I always say this, we're the oldest continuous democratic federation in the world. Since 1848, that includes Ontario, we've been working at democracy with high levels of, of people being allowed to vote. And high levels in the beginning, women were left out, but you know, little mistakes, it's a joke. Um, and, uh, uh, but you know, we've been at this a long time. We know what democracy looks like. And all I can say is the way that this has been done is, is not democracy. Getting something through the legislature or parliament is like, uh, it's, it's like the punctuation in a democratic sentence. That's all it is, because you've got the majority. The democratic sentence is made up of uh, the public debate, uh, convincing the public that this is what should be done, carrying, making people believe that this is an honest and this is good for the public good. And I think that none of this has been done in this case, frankly. This is, I don't consider this to be a democratic undertaking, what's, what might happen uh, in this case. Because basically, they, by taking away what they did was they took away the barriers to action. Those aren't barriers to action. Those are democratic principles. And I, I promise you that if, and I don't know if it's been appealed to the Supreme Court, but if those actions are appealed to the Supreme Court, I can almost guarantee you, almost, that the Supreme Court will throw the government's actions out, but by then the trees will be cut down, et cetera, et cetera, because it'll take time. But what they've done does not meet any of the standards of democracy in Canada. And it's really embarrassing because, you know, we're Ontarians. This is our government. This is democracy. And there are moments when your government doesn't do what they don't act with the self-limitation of democracy, and that calls upon us to um, do things, to act to put ourselves in their way. And I think that's, you know, that's why we're here tonight, but I think coming here tonight is only a small step. I think we're gonna have to be there on the spot to try and slow them down, prevent them from moving forward uh, as much as we can. Does that answer your question more or less? I, and, 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 and just let me say, that, that, you know, to, to, to without, to get citizens to pay for a parking garage of 1,000 to 2,500 spots under the lake, we pay for that for a private spa on public land. I mean, that sentence is fundamentally a conclusion. That tells you everything about what's wrong. That you imagine going before the Supreme Court and saying, talking about that. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so I, I, I think you can go through the whole thing and, and uh, you know, assigning a 95-year lease and not making it public. The whole thing is happening without the documents being made public. I'm sorry, the, the essence of democracy in Canada is transparency, not secrecy. So the fact that they're not making it public is anti-democratic. It's not because they're conservative versus liberal or anything else. It's not about having an opinion Philosophically and historically and politically, it's anti-democratic. And I think we have to be very clear, certainly I'm going to be increasingly clear in my language, that I believe what's happening is anti-democratic action. And it has to be treated that way by the courts and by the people. Thank you.
So um, this is my question to you. So many people um, in this room and um, you know in the city will remember in the early 2000s that we were warned that Porter and the Island Airport and the expansion of the uh, the plane service out of the Island Airport would destroy the waterfront. Um, but the sky didn't fall. The waterfront, you know, continues to operate. The airport continues to operate. So do you think that the same dynamic will come to play in this situation? There's no comparison. There's no comparison, I think, with the, uh, with the, uh, the island airport, which has lit, which has, is this a long way wrong? Just right out. Yeah. Oh, like a torch singer. Um, <laughs> uh, there's no comparison with the, with the airport. The airport is li limited to uh, the size of airplanes that can come in on that landing strip. On that, oh, the airport is limited to the number to the the size of the airplanes that are allowed to land there. And I think it's nothing bigger than an Embraer that can get in there now. And they we've successfully fought off any idea of expanding it uh, because precisely because we have appreciated our waterfront. And because the, when I came to Toronto in 1956, you know, in, in the Neanderthal age, um, there was no waterfront. Nobody went to the waterfront. You didn't know there was a waterfront in Toronto. Uh, there was all blocked off with rail lines and various things. You never took walks to the waterfront. There was no idea that there was really a waterfront. And so that's all developed within the time that I have been a Toronto resident, and I've been thrilled to see it. And of course, you know, the lakes are really important. And when you go to Chicago and you see what they have done over the years for their, la for their lakefront, you think, well, we need that. But I would like to say that, that an access point like an airport um, the little one that's been developed, and it's, if it's keep, kept small, it'll be just fine. I don't worry about that if it's kept small. I would worry about it immediately if they decided they were going to make it bigger or all those plans that they were going to do. But Ontario Place is a public place. It was started as a public space by Premier Robards with a great vision that came out of Expo 67 when we had the most wonderful uh, pavilion at Expo 67, and we sang Ontario Ario, a place to stand and a place to grow, and we all loved that, and we wanted to transport it, and we wanted to make Chris Chapman's film a reality in our minds, and, and we wanted to live that, and so Ontario Place was really born, and Ebbs Idler created those pods, and the, the land, you know, with a million cubic liters of, of earth was, was reclaimed, and and that meant that that part of the waterfront, which you know actually links um, links something in Toronto all the way along the waterfront, was claimed back and was made public. That's the whole beauty of it, that it's public. It should mean something to us to have public in a, in a city like Toronto. And I think I will, you know, I've fought all these fights over the years, including the Spinet Expressway, and I don't pat myself on the back, and none, none of us should, for stopping the Spadina Expressway. Bill Davis stopped the Spadina Expressway. The, the, everything was in place for it to go ahead, and he was the one who was persuaded by people to say no at the level of the province. But it was all a go. We had fought like mad and we didn't win. And so I'm used to feeling that I'll fight like mad and I might not win, but certainly for Ontario Place, because it's been what it is and because we saw what it has become during COVID, we walked down there a lot. And we walked, we had never walked uh, west before, and we walked through Coronation Park and then into Ontario Place and along and saw, yes, that, that nature was taking over, you know, buildings were crumbling perhaps, but that maybe that's what should be, you know, why don't we have an, a, a lovely park down that's, that doesn't have to have a, attractions, hate that word, in it, um, and that, that we could just reclaim that as a place where people could walk to close to the water that has you know, now the 60, 70 year old trees that will grow older and older. What's wrong with that? Why, why, does, why do we have to have an attraction? Maybe attractions could go in the portlands where there's going to be whole areas that are going to be, you know, released to the public to, to have things in. Uh, when we change the direction of the Don River coming in, there'll be all this new land. It's really going to be very remarkable. Why do we have to have something like 
you know, Wolf Lodge water park, you know, at the bottom of our, at, right in a prime spot in, in where we've planted trees, where it has been thought out, where people have really been able to live and love that place. I just don't understand it. And I do understand the concept of public because that was always meant to be a public place. And if it becomes a private place, you know, there's going to be all sorts of problems about it. I, I worry about it because I think, you know, it's going to be considered to be somebody else's property. And those trees that were very thoughtfully planted, the choice of the trees, the lagoons, all of it, okay, it's falling into decrepitude, but I'm sure that we could maintain it. And why would we take park that has grown up sort of naturally now and let it go? I mean, I, I, I don't understand it. I don't understand why, but I now know our Annex uh, uh, Residents Association had alerted us to a meeting with the city the other night, and I didn't know what was, we had it on while I was cooking. And I was listening to people droning on and on. I realized it's a reaction of the city to Bill 154, because all our heritage designations are going to be dis done away with, right? And our house is her heritage designated in the Annex, as is most of our block. So that we are going to have to fight now to not have people say, oh yeah, we'd like to have an 18-story building right there, you know, for going up from the corner of Lowther up to, up to Bernard or something, and then we'll, you know, destroy some other things. Because once that heritage designation is gone, uh, and we've been designated since 1974, uh, it, will, it means that there's no protections whatsoever. And I, and I see this as, this is the fat end of the wedge being, being hit, we're being hit with this. And we have to be realistic that this is, as John says, totally undemocratic. Uh, taking public space out of the public venue is something that Europeans would laugh at us. You know, they treasure things like the, when things are public, they, be, they stay public. You don't think a city like Paris stays the way it does because, you know, people have developed things in it. It stayed the way it has because they've had stringent rules. They've had all of that kind of thing for years, and that's what it means to care about your city and to care about what the public spaces are. And I'm just going to add in on top of, because we talked a lot about this this afternoon, yeah. advantages and disadvantages of leading up to it. We're really together on a stage. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, this is a park area. This is where people have walked for a long time. Uh, it's not a building area. There is no reason, and I went this afternoon and had a good look at, at, at the Portlands. They're desperate for more buildings. They want beautiful big buildings there. There is no, if we need to have a spa, I actually haven't met anybody on the street in the last couple of years asking for a spa. <laughs> I get around, I get around. Nobody I've heard anywhere at any level has asked for a spa. But okay, I'm not seeing the right people. Um, <laughs> but if we need a spa, put it down where all the cars are coming, where the boats are going to be, put it in the Portlands. It could be great with wonderful architecture. It could be really exciting, a real attraction spot. It isn't, a, wanting to have a spa is not a reason to put a building in the middle of a park area. It just is not a reason to do that. Okay, so the last question um, is for Walter. Um, so here's, here's my question. So if the province does go ahead with the Therme Spa on the West Island, what needs to happen, in your view, to redeem what's left of Ontario Place? Well, I'd like to preface that with the question of what is Ontario Place? Uh, I've got a little history review. Imagining Toronto, and this is addressing to you, what's your imagination for the future of Toronto? 95 years from now, it'll be the year 2119. What will Ontario Place be? What will the waterfront be? What's your imagination? Simcoe, in 1793, had a gridiron city based on the Roman principles of the Cardus and Decumanus, which was a fortified. The image was a fort city with wilderness to tame. Oh, you know what? There's something interesting about Ontario Place and Tommy Thompson Park, my whole conception was to create 
urban wilds. And what's happening throughout the world now? I just spent a month wilding in Scotland, wilding in Japan. People desperate not for buildings at health, but nature as health. Trillium Park has 1.2 million people visitors a year without advertising. It meets the needs of people who live in 600 square feet. One couple I meet, I'm there almost every day. Four people in 600 square feet. They need Trillium Park, mental health, infinite views, unstructured, urban wild, waves, wind, birds. Another vision of a city, and I've been studying nature and culture ever since I grew up in Central Park, Prospect Park, Jamaica Bay, the Palisades. New York City is the greenest city in the world. I believe that. Come with me next time we go to New York together. Burnham, who's been to Chicago? A famous architect, 1909. The lakefront by right belongs to all the people, regardless of income. Not a foot of its shores should be appropriated to the exclusion of the people. And it's been kept that way and built on over the years. Nature and culture in the city. If you ask me my vision over the years I've been working on the Toronto waterfront, it's very simple. It's called the Emerald Necklace. And the Scarborough Bluffs, the Portlands now, the magnificent new Portlands. Cherry Beach, Tommy Thompson Park, the Toronto Islands, Ontario Place, the big OP, the big emerald. And my work now continuing to the Humber, to the Humber Bay. I think that's an interesting vision for the city. What are the drivers today? Mental health is, and physical health is going to deal with climate change, air, water, extinction of species, resilient cities. If we go 25 years from now, now imagine this. What building is going to last for 95 years? We're in the year 2119. What is your city like in the year 2119? What do you envision the city of Toronto to be? What building on Ontario Place is going to last for 95 years? If it doesn't last, what happens to the refit of that building? Are we going to have a casino? Are we going to have a bankrupt building? King Ranch Spa went bankrupt. I worked with Jack Diamond after two years and wanted to receive a ship. It's now the CIB's corporate center. So we have to think of adaptive reuse. If these buildings go ahead, what is their future purpose? But the real kicker in this, and I'm going to answer your question about Ontario Place, if the trees that are there now were left to grow, and we have it here, the vision, when we started Trillium Park, was basically a triad. The East Island was the East Forest. The real center of attraction goes back to people who remember the 70s and 80s, the harbor, I call it Ontario Port, with the xylopods, the IMAX, Michael Huff's wind and wave protection mounds. You know, I go around the province a lot, I ask people about what do they know about Ontario Place? And they say, who? And I think of John Ralston Saul's book, The Unconscious Civilization. People really do not know about Ontario Place. It's a 70s and 80s phenomenon. So what happens? Anything can go right now. Anything can go because people are uninformed. Who wrote about this in 1949? Orwell. 1984 is here, alive and well, as John has articulated. Answer the question now. Adrian Huff was there with you, Bridget, last fall. That tree is 150 feet high. That's the height of the trees that can be achieved. The spruce right now on the West Island are about 60 feet high. Stephen has beautiful photographs of them. They spruce grow about a foot a year, maybe more, depending on the conditions. People say it's too hostile to grow in uh, the islands. No. 
look at the growth of the Trillium Park trees, designed as a wilderness forest. That's the scale of a person. Imagine if we had the Mariposa Grove or the Cathedral Grove in Vancouver Island. Ontario Place with its ecology, unique West Island ecology, is the only place in Lake Ontario with a coniferous forest that could reach 150 feet. Not Point Pelee, not Long Point. Ontario Place West Island could be our cathedral. Tell me about wellness. Don't tell me about buildings of wellness. Tell me about what happens to people who go into the wild, into the magnificent Gothic Chartres cathedrals that these, these trees could be. There's Adrian when he gave his impassioned speech about his dad. And he said to me, you know, my favorite day was when Bill Davis came to me, 1969, when Michael had Adrian on the site and he was planting the trees. Bill Davis, always a gentleman, came over to Adrian, extended his hand, shook his hand, and said, what a great job your father is doing. It's here for posterity. And Adrian cried, and I cried. Okay, here we are. That's the West Island today. That's human scale. Right now, that's human scale. Now, who knows what's going to happen? The Federal Migratory Bird Act comes into effect on April 1st. After April 1st, there's no cutting. That gives us the month of March. Who knows? Maybe the architect in the office, the audience can tell us what the cutting schedule is. The abomination of destroying, in the age of climate, resilience, global warming, did a clear cut, a Macmillan Bodell clear cut, in the Toronto, city of Toronto, a city of four million people, desperately wants clean air, desperately wants cleansing of the water, wants wildlife habitat for peregrine falcons and hawks, endangered species, and we're going to cut it down with gas-powered chainsaws. I mean, come on. Anyway, did I answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, John. Okay. So I think that we have time for a couple of questions. So just, uh, if you put up your hand, uh, is the gentleman at the back? Yeah, I just have a question. Uh, from what I understand, uh, with regard to Highway 413, another similarly uh, debated project, someone found some tiny frog, which is in, on the Federal Endangered Species Act, and that's basically going to potentially quash the project. And I just wondered if anyone knows if there's any possible, like, you know, golden goose endangered species on the West Island that could possibly be helpful. Did, did everyone hear the question? Yeah, okay. Um, go ahead. Your question is so right. The peregrine falcon is still listed as an endangered species. It loves the high spruce on the West Island. I go there, as well as the red-tailed hawk. They're alive and well, they're breeding, they're nesting, as well as some of our unique ducks are beginning to inhabit Ontario Place. And the fish habitat, we're working right now with this group, a group in Scotland, develop wetlands, floating wetlands, to re-establish our minnow population in the shallows of Ontario Place. So, because we're losing some of our larger fish, but we have the opportunity in Ontario Place for new spawning areas for the little fellows, or little lady, ladies too, the minnows. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. All right. I'm gonna talk about the elephant in the room, <laughs> which is the indigenous partnership with the third spa. Mm. It's a difficult, difficult, heartbreaking topic for me to address. I've worked closely with the Mississaugas of the Credit in the last decade, and I have immense respect for them. But today I saw a video in which their former Gima, Chief Stacy Laforme, tried to convince the audience that embracing the Thurm Spa model of privatizing public land for a private spa was about wellness and spoke to indigenous belief systems about the environment. And, and I need people in the room to, to help me understand 
how we address this deep concern, Ontario Place would be a wonderful opportunity for an Indigenous interpretive centre on the Great Lakes. So, How do we turn this around with the Mississaugas? Okay, so we actually had a discussion about this uh, uh, when we had the pre-conversation. So I would note that there is no representative of the Mississaugas and the New Credit here to respond to that question. It's a good question. Um, you know, it's something that, you know, maybe somebody in my profession should take up, but we don't have a representative to speak on their behalf. We don't, we shouldn't speak on their behalf, and there's nobody here to sp speak for them. So, um, and, and just to add a sentence to that, I mean, <clears throat> you know, uh, a lot of people like, would like there to be, well, what do Indigenous people think? You know, what do French Canadians think? Good luck. What do English Canadians think? What do Ontarians think? There are a lot of opinions. There are a lot of different opinions. And, uh, you know, Stacy's a great guy, I know him, but, but there are a lot of opinions, and I think one has to be very, very careful about saying, well, somebody's spoken, therefore, you know. Um, one more question. Anybody at the back? You, Sorry. yeah. This underwater parking garage for <laughs> 2,000 odd cars, that we have to keep the water out of for 95 years? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to understand. So the question is, uh, the gentleman is trying to understand, I think as we all are, uh, uh, what to do with an underground parking garage that has 2,100 spaces. Any, see, anyone want to take that on? Uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure that's the case any longer. Olivia Chow has talked with the Ford government and a quid pro quo for the province taking over the Don Valley Parkway and the Gardner Expressway is that the parking might be moved to Exhibition Place where you have a five meter height difference above the water table and if it was built in time, you could also serve FIFA, it's coming in 2026. Now, you know, today is 2024. How do you sponsor seven FIFA games and build an underground parking garage in that period of time? Underground parking is $122,000 on average per car. Above grade, $88,000 per car. So if it goes into the, you know, these are big ifs, right? If it goes underwater, yes, we have the Spadina Key has an underground parking garage. It leaks. Uh, it's probably 95 years of, you know, what, look at your roof. How long does your roof last? So uh, we're looking at not only operating costs, but in, uh, capital costs, but in terms of incredible operating costs. Uh, it's my understanding that it's more than a thousand cars because Live Nation also has an agreement for parking uh, for a thousand cars, uh, the, the spa, a thousand cars, the surface parking is about uh, 11,112 cars. So we have a shortfall of a couple of thousand cars. So, uh, but meanwhile, we're building for 2017, we have an interior line subway which maybe negates the need for all the cars. So why are we building a new subway station at the Canadian at Na National Play Exhibition Place, CNE, when we are trying to get people out of cars? Well, the issue then is tourism. We're gonna bring people from Buffalo, we'll have a world attraction, da, da, da. I thought Trillium Park was a world attraction. I mean, from people from France and Russia and China and Korea every day of the week because the thing is called the web. People know they, how they get there by public transit. If you can do it from Moscow and Prague, you can certainly do it from Etobicoke and Buffalo. So, you know, I think we, we have some big questions to ask whether we are the city of the future by continuing to build automobile-based sprawl and Lakeshore Boulevard, at, at best, I live on Lakeshore Boulevard, I can barely go there on the weekends anymore because of traffic and pollution, noise. It's not safe. I just add, um, we had, I, I think it's the 25th anniversary of the Rogers, um, sorry, the, not the, sorry, I'm thinking of the ACC, but uh, when the Rogers Center Sky Dome was built, um, you know, the city and Mel Aspen was talking about putting it in Downsview, and, uh, you know, there were groups advocating to put it down in, you know, in the rail, rail lands. And at the time, you know, there were a lot of people who said, there's no parking, there won't be any parking, how will people get there? People get there, so. 
Anyway, I'm going to stop here. Uh, Steve, where are you? Are you in hearing distance? Um, so Steve's going to say a few concluding remarks. Can I just add, because we haven't mentioned one thing, sure. which I think is just worth saying, which is uh, I d there's been very little talk about the, the, the corporate structure around the people who would build this thing. And when, you know, and I spent a couple of hours kind of looking at the big corporate structure, and I'm used to doing that. I kind of do it sort of for a living, looking at crazy corporate structures. And it's very, very complicated. I mean, you'd have to hire somebody to do a real examination, to try and make sense of it all. But <clears throat> there's no question that it's basically got an awful lot of things that are based in Luxembourg to avoid taxes uh, and uh, tax-free zones and numbered companies. And, you know, and I, as I was reading about them, with no offense to them, uh, I just thought, these don't sound like really good partners for the people of Toronto. That's what struck me. Without really coming to a conclusion, I, if I had a choice of partners, they wouldn't be at the top of my list as the kind of people I'd want to sit down over lunch and do a deal about the future of Toronto. You know? I'm not saying anything specific. It just didn't... I've read a lot about companies like that. It's just too clever by half, in a way, you know? And on that note, uh, thank you all for coming out. This has been a really interesting discussion. I hope it, it motivates further discussion and that you uh, hang around for this save rave um, and um, enjoy the rest of the evening. Take a look at the photographs. And um, like I said, uh, uh, we, we, we will be keeping an eye on things that are happening down at uh, West Island. Ontario Place for All will be watching. Uh, save the Trees uh, at op.com will be watching. So keep, a, keep an eye on the websites and uh, keep informed. And uh, I'm going to ask you also to act as uh, citizen, um, uh, sp citizen spies, uh, in a sense. Keep an eye on, on what you see happening at Ontario Place. If you start to see movement, if you start to see trees coming down, please, by all means, let us know. Uh, we want to be sure that we are on top of it when and if it happens. I'm hoping it's not going to happen. No doubt you are too. I appreciate you all coming out. Thank you very, very much. Take care.